The following program is for mature audiences only. The views expressed by the people and other guests on the podcast are their opinions and their own and don't reflect the institutions or establishments that they work for. So please do not get our asses fired or canceled. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. What's going on? It's Jay Whitaker. Welcome back to Glad You Made It Podcast. Glad you made it. Glad you're here. Um, it's been a good. It's been a good week. It's been a good week. I want to thank everyone. I'm at shows in Boston, and I want to thank people that are coming out to those shows in Boston. That was that was really cool. You know, it's hard being um, doing. It's hard. Stand up is is fun and. But it's kind of hard, but it's kind of easy, but it's kind of crazy, but it's kind of fun. It's 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 the best. I love I love it. And to start over in a new city and, and get love is is it, you you can't help but just feel pretty dang good about that. So, um, you know, I have it was this one lady. Shout out to Hummus Lady, aka Karen. I had a Karen come through, but in a good way. You have to understand this story. I. Um, I did a show in Connecticut, like Westport or something. I don't know. But this uh, it was at this outdoor venue with a great comedian named uh, Jimmy Cash and Sean Sullivan. Make sure you go check them out. They're wonderful. Hopefully, I'll get both of them on the show. But we're doing this outdoor gig. And you know me. I, I like my birds, which we'll talk about in a minute. I like my birds. I'm in Westport. We're in this outdoor pavilion area. It's like this nice little... Uh, river, but they call it a sound. I don't like it. Yeah, it's not a river. Don't call it a river or a lake or a creek or something. No, they call it a sound. Like they just different out here. I don't know. So I'm I'm by the sound and I see a red tail hawk swoop down and grab a fish from the water. It was the most gangster shit I ever seen in my life. And uh, then I had to go do comedy and I did it in this outdoor venue. I thought it was gonna rain, but then. I was up on the stage. There's maybe like 400 people there. and um, But they're so far away from the stage. And I'm like, this is weird. So I just jumped off the stage, hopped out on the grass, sat and did like half of my set, eating, uh, stealing from people's veggie plates and shit. I stole uh, having, you know, sips of wine and stuff. It was, it was a good time. And then I came across this one lady. She had, she's like, I brought my own hummus. And she was just real sweet and uh, hung out with her and her, her and her family, did my set, talked to them for a little bit. This was like three months ago. And sure enough, after my show in Boston, she's like, remember me? I'm hummus lady, which is like, <laughs> it's like, all right, if that's how you want to be remembered, hummus lady. All right, well, thank you. And um, so it was, it was cool to just kind of get that love and, you know, I'm realizing I'm slowly building the following here in Boston and the New England area. And it's kind of cool, like, because I didn't think I, you know, I'm not, I have very low expectations when I headline a show out here. And uh, so when you see people come out, you know, it's, it's really cool because you're just like, oh, shit, y'all do care. Y'all kind of maybe possibly know who I am or maybe you just got. You saw that we was giving out free pizza or you just genuinely want to see comedy. I don't know. But either way, I'm just glad that people came through for a brother. That was real cool. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I got to address the elephant in the room. Full Feather Friday is back for those who are not familiar with Full Feather Friday. During It's really started back in 2016. Yeah, back in 2016, I started on Instagram. Just started just aggressively uh, typing out bird facts and like I would comment, I would get all these pictures of, of birds and I would just like kind of uh, just 
I don't know, describe, just aggressively describe them in an, in an urban vernacular, you know, with the urban swagger of a, of a hip hop teen as, uh, as the woke would say it. But uh, yeah, I would just kind of just describe it that way. And it was kind of silly and it just was, it just kind of stuck. I did it for like six weeks and then probably back in 20, people liked it. But back in 2020, when we had nothing to do, I brought it back and did it like almost every week for a while. There's like some, there's like 40 episodes maybe, but I realized it took way too long to do. Plus I was uh, living with my mother-in-law, not that she was against it. It was just like, I just wanted to be respectful of her household because the last thing she wants to hear is her future son-in-law screaming about why he likes the California condor so goddamn much. So that's not, that's not conducive to who wants to see that. So now that I, I'm a homeowner, I got a full on backyard. So I, I just did the episode. I decided for no reason at all, just to do full feather Friday again, even though it's almost the summer's basically over. Uh, hope you had a good summer. Summer's basically over. And, uh, Bird watching season is not really in, is not going to be really be in, but still, I could still be outside. But now I just decided to bring it back and I did this whole thing and I'm, it was just good to see the responses from it. People were glad. They're like, oh shit, I missed this. And so I'll keep it going. Uh, so thank you for supporting, you know, I, I gave five tips on bird watching, you know, that was, there was no, like I, it was my, People said it was one of my best episodes of Full Feather Friday. And it, I didn't even talk, I didn't even feature a bird. That's what it was. For, for If you don't know what it is, it's just like every Friday, I come up with a bird. I aggressively yell facts at you. I hold your timeline hostage for a minute. And then I get the hell out of there. And I did this one and I just gave five bird watching. Like, here's what you need to start bird watching because it's a very easy hobby to get into. One, you need a hat. Two, need binoculars. Three, you need a guide. Four, you need camera. Five, you need patience. That's it. So, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make it bird watching seem accessible, so to speak. So that was, that was it. That was, you know, that's some stuff that's coming up. Wise Guys Ogden, I'm going to be there this weekend at uh, Wise Guys Ogden in Utah. Come see me. It'll be a good time. I got some more shows coming up. I'm going up to New Hampshire soon. Um, I got some other shows in the works. I've, I just need to lock them down and confirm them. But uh, I'll keep you all posted, and I appreciate uh, all the Patreon folks that are supporting the show. If you want to support the podcast, go to gladyoumadeit.com. Uh, excuse me. Go to patreon.com. Gladyoumadeitpodcast. Uh, I'm going to give... Switch. I'm gonna get right to it. We got a we got a good episode for y'all today. I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. But I want to give the gratitude to just human beings in general. Okay, I can't speak on certain things right now. Uh, but if you follow where I currently live and what things are going on, I would just say. Just be kind to people because you don't know how bad people have got it. Like, you don't really know what people are going through until they go through it, you know? Um, yeah, you know, just try to be kind to one another. Try to be kind. Also, uh, there was a story uh, I thought I saw there was some lady, a uh, Florida teacher, got fired for twerking on a student. I know that's I know that switched gears very quickly, but I she yes uh, I, yes she got fired for twerking on a student. I, I want to say oh, let me let me confirm this. But like my big question is, what song was it? Yeah, teacher arrested for twerking on a student. Uh, this was a former Christian school teacher, uh, already charged with sex crimes now due to twerking on a student at prom. Okay. At a prom. This was in Florida. What song was it? What song? I think that that's the question that we're not asking. Okay. 
listen. I, I this is a weird area, but I just do want to know what song. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I'm not supporting this. I'm not against it. I just want to know what song it was. That's a fair perspective. Okay? What song do you think it was? I want to know. Email me, comment, whatever. Uh well all I can say is going back to like I know I love I like how I was to say, doing something inspirational and heartfelt, and I immediately switch it to uh, a, a Christian school teacher uh, twerking on a student at a prom. And I'm gonna try and ma- I'm I'm a, I'm gonna make a weird attempt to try and make this wholesome, not th- not what she did, but I'm just gonna say, look, you don't know what people are going through. Try to be kind, you know, and try to be ex- an accessible human being. Don't twerk on students. Don't do that. You know, why does Florida have to Florida? Okay. What? I will tell you who doesn't get gratitude. My damn Raiders. Oh, my God. Guys, y'all don't understand. I'm watching, I'm watching the Raiders game with my wife. She knows football but doesn't really get some of the rules. And she saw me, like, kick a box in sandals. It was, by the way, I had a good Sunday because I had that usually my Sundays after, after I have a weekend of shows, I like to relax and I put on my relax underwear. I got this pair of purple spandex and I wear them when I need, when I need to relax and I wore them all day and I wasn't, I was dancing. I wasn't twerking on those students, but I was dancing. Had me a good, had me a good relaxed weekend. But then I watched the Raiders and I saw they screwed up their game at the last minute, and I I kicked the box. I, I I actually was mad. I was like, when did I become this person? We out here kicking boxes. This is an empty box, but I was like, why we kicking boxes? Because of football, dude. Like, chill. It's not that serious. But anyway, I appreciate. Everybody supporting the podcast. We're getting some great views. We're getting some listeners from all over the country, all over the world. It's pretty dope. I, I like I like that people rock with me. So um, this episode is going to be, it, we don't have a comedian on this episode, but we have our first doctor. We have our first doctor, y'all. Dr. Marisol Capijan. Uh, she's a full-time lecturer at the Miami Herbert business, or she was a uh, full-time lecturer, a leadership and mindset trainer. She's a women empowerment perspe- uh, professional speaker and a certified executive coach. Like this is, we're going to talk about women in the workplace. My wife joins me for, uh, for this episode. We're going to talk about uh, racial discrimination in the workplace. We're going to talk about that glass ceiling. We, we really get into that. Um, this woman knows exactly what she's talking about. Like, I just want, like, and if you disagree with her, uh, wait till you hear her story. You know, she has got an amazing story. Uh, and f- why did why I even say that? Like, you just listen to what she has to say. She keeps it real. Um, you're going to learn some new words. You're going to le- learn some new jargon. So I just listen up. Have a Have a good time with this episode. Hope that you learn a lot, and I hope that you, uh, um, if you, if the words resonate with you, I really want to know your perspective. I really want to hear from you because I know there are women of color that listen to this show. I want your, I want to hear your perspective. So please email us at gladyoumadeitpodcast at gmail dot com. I want to uh, confirm some of these things that go on in the, in the workplace. Um, and so uh, I, I just really hope I, I just thank everybody for listening to the show and. Um, I, I can't wait to get into this interview with, you know, first doctor on the episode. All right. Peace. We'll be right back. What's going on, Glad Gang? How are we doing today in studio today? I am joined by my amazing wife, but we also have, I'm very excited about this guest today. Um, I'm going to read her bio today because this is this 
this is awesome. This is our first doctor that we have on the show. Um, I'm, ve- I'm actually very excited about that. Um, full-time management faculty, associate director of the Master's in Leadership Program for Miami Herbert Business School, a certified executive coach, a leadership and mindset corporate trainer, and a professional public speaker. Uh, she has a doctorate in higher education, leadership, and administration from the University of Miami. Uh, she has delivered workshops for U.S.-based organizations such as American Tower Corporation, NBC Universal, Year Up, and the National Black MBA Association. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Marisol Capijan. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for having me here. Oh, I love how you read that introduction. I just want to make a little <laughs> note that I'm the former. I used to teach at the University of Miami. Oh, right? okay, okay. All yeah. right, all right. Former. The former associate director, which is kind of how I, you know, started writing that book. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, yeah, well, I, I apologize for the, for the intro, but you're our first doctor on the episode, and I do appreciate yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, for sure just for coming through and uh, just taking time out of your busy day. I know you had to drop your son off to play some tennis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is, and this is how you unwind is doing some podcasting in between. <laughs> yes. So uh, real quick, I just, I, um, so let's just start from the, from the beginning. Uh, could you tell us about uh, where you're from and how did we, and how did we get here to where we're at now? Okay, so I'm from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latina. Yes, hey. island. Yes, and um, I came to the U.S. when I was 16 years old. And when I came to the U.S., you know, coming from a very poor background, you hear all the time that, you know, U.S. is like the best country in the world and everybody should go to come to the U.S. and make you know, all their dreams happen. But when you come here, it's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I came here. And it was very hard because at 17, I ended up being homeless. And I had to, you know, they call it surf couching or couch surfing. And I slept in somebody else's living room for two years, living room next to a kitchen. But I I was very determined to get my education. So while I'm going through that and I'm going to, I'm going, I'm working at McDonald's and I'm cleaning floors and I'm doing all of these things. I'm still going to school and I graduated with honors with my bachelor's degree. Yes. And then went for my master's degree where I graduated top of my class. And then I went for my doctoral degree because we usually tell women, women and minorities that all you need to do to get ahead in life is just play the system, you know, get your education, get your credentials, get good, you know, um, get a good performance, make sure you're excellent at everything that you do. And while you're doing that, and I I know some women can relate to me and minorities too, you know, sometimes it's not all about the education and the degrees. Um, You know, if you have a terrible manager, you have somebody who cannot see past your color, your gender, it's very hard to get ahead. So I started doing, I did my dissertation on the trajectory of women to leadership positions. So how do women get to the top? And I discovered, or while I was reading and doing my dissertation that, there are more women than men with degrees in preparation. However, they're not represented. And mm. then, so the problem is not based on whether they're prepared or not. It has to do a lot with systemic biases and challenges that they face in their work and also in society. Well, well first of all, thank you for sharing that. And like... I like that we you you ended that sentence with systemic biases because I've t- we've I mean to people listening that don't think that this is real, um, I'm interviewing a doctor on the show to explain this because a lot of people don't. It, it's frustrating because when people hear systemic racism, they hear systemic bias or biases, they think like, oh, you know, it's it's not like that. You're mo- you, people must be one of the no. No, 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 no. This, these are, these are, there's, these, are, these are real things, and um, they, they clearly affect lives. And so, what has been like the biggest thing, and what has been the biggest thing that you've just learned in this whole process? Like, to, just to sum it up, if you had thirty, if like thirty seconds to just explain it, like. So the biggest thing that I learned was with my own experience, because mm-hmm. when I started working at the University of Miami. 
I, you know, I started as a temp and then I moved up to becoming a program manager and then I worked my way up and then I became a faculty and I started teaching and then I just hit that ceiling. Like I just hit a ceiling that I was like, yep. what's going on? Like what's, I have the degrees, I have everything that people supposed to that you need to have. And then it's just, it's, it's in a way basically that people are not used to, they're not used to seeing someone like you. Mm -hmm. Maybe be successful or have a leadership role, or maybe when it comes to mothers, people expect that if you're a mother, you don't have time to work on your career, that you have to pick one or the other. Or if you are a, a black woman and you have an accent, that you're not competent. So I feel like you're not competent, even though you may be the person who's more like who knows about the topic more than everyone else in the room. So it's very, right. it's very subtle at the beginning, right? Because it can look like you being in a meeting and you being the expert in that meeting, but then all the questions go to the person that doesn't look like you because they look different than you. And then you have to right. be like in the back saying, but it's me. <laughs> I'm right. the one who's the expert they treat in this. <laughs> Right. It seems like they treat you kind of like a, like a, like a little puppy, you know, uh, I've had this in like, no, I will, I'll be the first to say I'm nowhere near as qualified as, as you and, and I wish I had the drive that you have. And, uh, but where you get kind of treated like this, yeah, this little puppy. And then the soon, the second you, I don't know, uh, the second you really start showing your worth and showing your value, all of a sudden they see you as this kind of threat. I don't know if, um, has there, there is a term for that. Like that, or? that a scientist, there's a term, yes. wait, what? Ooh. Yes. It's called the, we love vocabulary. It's called the pet to threat phenomenon that happens to black women. Ooh. There is a term to that. So I didn't, Ooh. I didn't, I didn't discover this, but when I was reading about what was mm -hmm. happening to me in my dissertation, I discovered this phenomenon that has been studied where black women are treated like a pet at the beginning, like a little puppy. Like, look, we just hired somebody who's a minority. We hired somebody and we're encouraging her to go out and like pursue her dream. But the mm -hmm. minute you start showing your confidence, the, the, your confidence, the minute you start showing, yeah. I belong here. This is, I'm not here because I'm not, I'm a diversity hire or you were doing a favor. I belong right. here because I'm competent. All of a sudden you become a threat because you were never hired to, to move up in the, in the corporate ladder or to, you know, or right. to be promoted, you were hired to be like, to play a role, which is that role of being mm. like that diverse hire or that role of like, you're my mentee, yeah. but there is a term for that. And that actually shows in the literature. That's why I love to talk about these things. Wow. I didn't, yeah, I didn't even know there was a thing. I mean, and I obviously it's more common with dealing with black women, dealing with but black it women. It happens to minority. I've seen it with. Yeah. Yeah, just it seems like it. It seems like this can go for, kind of spread across the, as 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 Ah, I can't even talk right now. Spread across from everywhere. Um, like, so my another question that I do have is just that. So how do we get rid of it? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I know that's. I know that's a. I mean. A long winded, long winded question. I yeah. truly believe that after the case of the way that I was treated at the university and the things that happened to me, that a lot of those things could have avoided if we had good leadership. And mm -hmm. I do feel like a lot of people that are in power right now, they're not there for the right reasons. And we mm -hmm. usually so, so see someone who's confident, who's tall, or who has certain qualities, and we automatically assume think that, oh, that person may be a great leader. Look at their persona. Look how they communicate. They're effective communicators. They have charisma. And all of a sudden we say, oh, that yeah. may be a great leader. But that person can be terrible with people. Discriminatory, yeah. bully, harasser. But you know what? We're looking at these external qualities and other qualities that really do matter, which is, are they good with people? Are they responsible? Do they develop the talent that are under them? Do they foster a good work, a culture where people feel safe, where they feel that they belong? We're not measuring leaders by those type of qualities. We're measuring them on the things that are 
external, the things that we can see. But behind closed doors, like I've had experience with a leader that you see her outside and people may say, well, she's amazing. She dresses so nice and she's so put together and she's so well-spoken and, you know, she's she's a great person. But then behind closed doors, she was like yeah. the worst person I ever interacted with. She was a monster. <laughs> and then mm. what happened is when you have minorities going through challenges in the workplace and harassment and bullying and discrimination, and then they ask for help from from HR, which you learn that HR is not there to help you. <laughs> Is there to help the company not get sued? So be careful out there. Yeah. Um, then you go and try to get the situation fixed. And then you have, then, you know, you start seeing, well, the whole system, because now it's not happening in a vacuum. Not, now everybody knows what's happening, but nobody's willing to step up. So I think leadership needs to change. The people that are in power needs to change. We need new a new generation of inclusive leaders, or at least leaders that care about the people that they're serving. And then we also right. need people who fight against these biases and, and can look at a person that looks like me or somebody who looks like a, a, a minority and say, well, that person is fit for a leadership role. The same way that this person can be fit for a leadership role. Their race and gender right. doesn't mean anything about their potential. I mean, yeah, it should be focused on, are they, do they do the job? Are they great with people? Yeah. And do they, and, and are they knowledgeable? And, and, you know, um, I, you know, we always talk about celebrating diversity and that make them that that's our strength. And, you know, it from I'm, I'm still in the military and that's, you know, we sit, we still say diversity is our strength. And, and in a lot of companies, it, it, it seems like, especially in the last couple of years that the focus on, D, you know, you say DEI five, five, 10 years ago, people were like, what are you talking about? But now it seems like it's so it's, it's such an important acronym. That's part of our everyday lexicon that it's just like okay but is it really know what that happening is now, but that's mm. what i wanted to talk to you about is it really happening because there's another term <laughs> which is called performative allyship and i see that a lot of companies have been mm -hmm. doing that which is it's a, a lot of formative allyship um it's performative mm -hmm. because we're doing it for our own social capital or to appear that we care to show people that we're women's first i mean I've seen the company, like, even when I talk about the university where I used to work at, where, like, simultaneously while things were happening to me, they're out there saying, like, we're one of the best employers for women. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> Did you interview any yeah. of the women that are working inside the company? Like, who told you that you were one of the best employers for women? So who are they interviewing <laughs> before they go out there and say, Forbes ranked us as one of the best you know, companies for diversity or for minorities. So I always like to see, I used to tell my students, like, if you want to see whether a company is diverse or not, you can always talk to the people, see how the climate is, but also look at their leadership. Like if I go mm. into a company's board or a company's like hierarchical system, and I see that all the minorities are at, in the bottom, like administrative roles, or roles that have to do yeah. with cleaning or everything in the bottom. And I say, the more you move up, the lighter and male it becomes. <laughs> I'm like, so where is the diversity at? <laughs> Are we doing yeah, diversity yeah. only at the bottom? Like, no, no it, shouldn't, right. it shouldn't be that way. Mm. Mm. It, sh it shouldn't, but it happens. And, and so I have a friend who was recently hired by a financial institution. I will not name the <laughs> financial institu institution, but that, you know, this woman is of Latin descent and she, you know, basically they were looking for diversity hires and, but she, it, she is a little underqualified and she had, she told me that in confidence, but she did want to pass up on the opportunity to take that position. Take it. And so it's like, uh, what do you what do you do mm -hmm. you know it, it it's it's because you you want you want the opportunity to move up in the world but it's just like you you feel like or are, are they just pandering just you know are they actually going to put me in a position to win are they going to give me the support are they going to give me the mentorship the training that they that they you know that they need and so that's why it's like sometimes i feel like are we being put in this position where we're set up to fail yeah yeah and and i completely get where you're coming from because 
it has happened to women. Um, there is a term called the glass cliff phenomenon. I'm like dropping terms here, but uh, basically, I know, but this is, love no, it. This is <laughs> love it. Awesome. Uh, it's basically where women are hired when they there is like there is a problem in the company, like people are going through financial crisis, and then they put a woman in charge, like knowing that she's gonna take the blame for the for what's going on, mm. and that has been researched in studies before. And that's why when I did my dissertation and I wrote about inclusivity and specifically about women, I said, their company needs to be intentional, not only when they hire, but the whole trajectory of the diversity hire. If you're going to hire somebody who's a diverse, from a diverse background, because supposedly you care about diversity, then what's the plan in the next three years? Are you putting that person in the programs, the training, the mentorship, like you said, the sponsorship? And then how are you going to make going to make sure that the person stay on track to move up the ladder? Like this diversity hiring that happens only like, oh, let's just show that we hire 20 black faculty. Yeah, but why don't you mention how many faculty left last year? Mm. Because the mm. culture is so toxic. So, the, the, you know, you have these numbers that you know, people go out and these companies say, yes, we have this, we improved our talent pool. We're bringing people, we're bringing people. Yes, but how many people are leaving? Because the culture is toxic. Right. So I think we have to look at both things. It's not about hiring, but about retaining the talent and developing the talent. Yeah. Retaining right, and talent. I feel like that, that also creates a pressure on those people getting hired that, okay, we hired you, now you gotta, you know, prove yourself and it's like, Mm -hmm. just they just get put in an impossible situation and, and it's very it's very challenging mentally because you're in a situation mm -hmm. and then people around you and some people that think you don't belong there they will be very quick to yeah. remind you that you know you're the best oh, yeah. you're not supposed to be here <laughs> or maybe it's going to be le it's going to be more subtle where people go out to lunch and then don't invite you because you know you it's like they hire you as a favor. And it's like, that's not the case. Like, that's not how you treat people. That's not how you treat people at all. So, ugh. and it sadly happens. I've, I know anybody that's listening. I know there are people, I have friends that listen to the show and I know that they're listening. And I, I'm thinking of a few faces in particular. Can I, what would you say to someone that is dealing with that situation right now? You know? So somebody who's dealing with that situation right now, I will say that if it's possible, if possible, because I know everybody's situation is different, I will go yeah. somewhere else. Because if mm -hmm. the people, your manager are treating you like that, that comes from the culture, that comes from leadership. It took yeah. me a while to realize that because I thought, okay, so it's my manager who's acting like that towards me. But maybe it's the leader knows about it and they know what's going on, they will protect me. But it's usually not. She's em she was empowered to do what she did because she knew she could get away with it, right? So mm -hmm. we have to think of like the the big system that happens. Like it's not about the person who's doing it to you, but that person has been empowered to do those things. They can do yeah. it because they can get away with it. So do you mm -hmm. want to work in a system? Do you want to work in a company that treats you that way? And sometimes you don't have any choice because some some of us, you know. I've met people that are single mothers, you know, we have the wealth gap because not everybody had the same opportunity to build generational wealth. So not everybody can just pick up yeah. and leave. That's another thing that we can talk about. I'm taking a oh, we can talk about it. We can get into it. What's... Yeah. So yeah. yeah for, I mean, like I know what's going on, but go ahead. No, I mean, please, I like to talk about, please explain when generational talk about diversity wealth. and inclusion. People just think about like the diversity high, but you don't understand the systemic, like you're trying to solve something systemic, which is, if there was a time in the US that, you know, black families wouldn't be able to, to buy houses in the nice neighborhoods. Right? Right. It's called red line. The red, red line. line. So you know about that, right? <laughs> so what happens like years and years and years later where you have certain families who were able to, to buy houses and build wealth and then certain families who could not generationally there is a lot that we're trying to do to catch up, to have the same health and the same opportunities as everybody else. So when you're doing like a diversity hire, like you have to think about like the social component of helping somebody that comes from a diversity background. It's not only about a company, 
showing that you have a diversity hire, what can that person do? For, what can that person do for the, his whole or her whole family? Like people don't understand sometimes when I remember when I was hired at one point right. and I was a, a homeless, I, I was an immigrant and people that work in diversity and inclusion, they want me, oh, that's weird that you don't own a house. <laughs> we all own houses. And I'm like, you cannot, how can mm -hmm. you even work in a city of inclusion? I don't understand mm -hmm. that the, the cards that we have a huge impact in the type of quality of life that yeah. we have. So, of course, I didn't have mommy and daddy paying for a lot of things for me. So, I'm not saying that because to, like, justify the yeah. way that I am mm -hmm. right now in my the economic, you know, financial that I have in my life. Because I'm a true believer that you can set your mind into doing whatever you want in your life and achieve it. I'm a mindset coach. So, I will be the first one to empower you to get out of the rut and get out there and do things. That's why I got a doctorate very early in my life and I got a master's degree and I got all of this. Like you can achieve all of those things, but I'm also, also cannot pretend that there are systemic things in that are affecting the quality of life that people from minority backgrounds have. And I think that it's very important that companies that are doing these diversity hires right. are really trying to make an impact in society. If I give this person that comes from an underprivileged background an opportunity and help them move up the ladder, I'm not only helping them, but I'm helping their next generation. So maybe their next generation can go to a private school. Maybe their next generation can go on nice trips, like I can go in nice trips with my family. So people yes. are very, they think that we have like a level, level playing field and that's, that's not the case. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? Okay, so we, due to technical difficulties, this episode, like, we lost, like, 20 minutes of this episode. 20. Uh, her connection dropped out. My connection went bad. Um, so, unfortunately, it is lost. But we do have the ending of this episode when she came back into the chat session. And it ended up being really good. So just continue, stay strong with this. I, I really wish we could get uh, the part where she talked about mindsets and talked about, you know, her her uh, story growing up and, you know, starting out at McDonald's and uh, well, we may have gotten into that. I'm not really sure, but I apologize for the delay on this episode and the technical difficulties. You know how, you, come on, you know how this goes. So be nice. Matter of fact, while you're at it, and yeah, this is a slight commercial break, but while you're at it, go to iTunes or Spotify, leave us a review, an honest one. If you, if you like us, great. If you love us, even better. If you hate us, okay, then that's fine. Work on yourself. I'm trying out here, but, um, yeah, this episode's late and, um, but we're going to still get it to you. Let's get right back into it. Let's close out strong. All right. Welcome back. It's, it's, it's all good. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so you were talking about um, your wife and you being broke at one time? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Back to that. Back, back to, to that. our broke asses. I, no, no, I love it. I love it. Because I'm going to tell you, my best moments have been like me, like working things out with my husband. He's like, that's where real partnership com comes in. Yeah. It really is, yeah. If you can go through that together, then you're solid. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Or just like uh, either financial stress or like emotional disaster, stress. like emotional stress with emotional stress, financial stress, and then throw in a, a, a little a little dash of a natural disaster. We had we had to deal with some f flooding in our wow. house, and. Uh, we had just bought the house and um, financial stress, emotional stress. And on top of that, I was trying to plan her birthday party. And then 
we had to cancel it, like, because the whole power went out. But we realized, like, we can get through a lot of things. We can literally get through a storm together because we've been through a lot of things together. And um, just seeing those times where we where we can remind each other, like, yo, we've been through this. We, you know, if we if we made it through all of these negative situations and all these uh, things that could easily take us out, we can survive anything. So I'm very, I'm very fortunate, very grateful. So I, I saw something yesterday that I thought it was very impactful. Um, you know how people, they're all out there trying to make money, trying to make money, trying to make money and trying to be successful. Yeah. And which is fine if this is your, you know, if that's your goal in life, it's fine. And, you know, I like money, so good. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, I, I like money. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie about that. And, but you know, when you don't have somebody with you or when the people that you love are sick, like very sick and no money in the world can save them. I'm like, yeah, those, I, I've seen stories like this and I'm like, you know, sometimes mm. you just realize like if you are healthy and you're alive and your loved ones are with you, that's all that matters because you know, why if you have everything but you cannot have health, that's very tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh well, I'm just grateful that I'm grateful for my health. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for a, a little bit of wealth. Just a little bit. Not a lot, but a, a decent smidgen. Good, because it comes, it keeps so coming when you're grateful for the little things, the big things come. Yeah, you know, and like I we when we moved in we we bought our first house last year and we celebrated like big time because that you know huge milestone we we knew it, yeah we knew it was a process and so you got to celebrate the little things i believe mm -hmm. you know um so i do want to talk cuz i know we we, we talked about writing letters to ourselves but now i do want to talk about something that you have written and you're working on your 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 book is done yes yeah. We're good. We're going Let's through the copywriting it. process right now. Um, and now we're doing mm -hmm. the pre-sale of the book. So I did a crowdfunding program that the Georgetown University has where they help you like write Georgetown. the book. Yeah, yes, but then you have to raise money to publish the book. Um, so it's, they call it a okay. hybrid process or hybrid publishing. So now in order for my book to be actually published and be in the hands of people in Barnes and Nobles and everywhere, in the, I need to sell pre-sale 200 copies. So I'm trying to, okay. um, you know, pre-sell the book. It's totally something new. Never done this before. Uh, it's very different than being in academia and writing articles for like magazines. I'm like, this is actually <laughs> something that I have to knock on doors and be like, please buy my book. Uh, but the book, <laughs> <laughs> the book basically talks about my experience in academia. And I talk about my experience because it was very traumatic. It's been like, I've been, it's been very hard to write the book because every time I write about the experience, I kind of relive it. Um, so you're getting it like yeah. fresh from what happened to me very recently in the status basically of women in academia and black women in academia and all these diversity hires and things that I witnessed, things that happened to me. And I also interviewed black women in Afro Latinas um, that work in tech. So I, mm. work, I interviewed uh, women that work in Meta, IBM, and all these companies. And I basically asked them, like, how was your career trajectory? What happened? Like, have you experienced, like, good treatment? Like, and all of those things are written in the book. And one of the things that I found very interesting is this grief of success, how I call it in the book is the term grief of success is a lot of uh, the women, black women that I interviewed, they talked about, like, you know, hustling and trying and trying so hard, but the, the pathway for them to achieve leadership positions was so hard that when they achieved it, they felt more grief than actually success because they felt like they got lost mm. in the process. It shouldn't have been that hard. They made it hard. Like people makes it hard, like so unnecessary that they feel like mm. they have to code switch, change who they are, give up their personality, give like assimilate to another culture in order to make all these succeed. sacrifices. Yeah. But by the time they get it, they just feel like, was it worth it? And basically yeah. what I'm trying to do is show people like, this is what's really going on. Like, this is not just yeah. 
DNI is not just a buzzword. This happens, and this is how you're impacting the lives of people and are impacting the well-being of women of, of women out there, and the well-being of Black women and Afro-Latinas, and is inhumane, unnecessary. Is very bad. So that's what I'm trying to do. It's basically show leaders how they can be inclusive and responsible, and also show Black women and Afro-Latinas and women like this is what some people go through, and it's not easy. And some people can make it, you know, I've heard people that say, well, some people can make it. I'm like, but do, does it have to be this way with career hazing and all? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's basically. Wow. What and then, the, and the name of the book is leadership is a responsibility, yes. correct? Yes. All right. So, and where, how can we support, where can we find it? Um, so I will send you the link. It's actually, it's like marisolcapiamanuscripts.com, okay, um, but I'm going to send you the link so you can put it maybe in the show notes or something. Um, but yes, that's the, the website is up there. It talks a little bit about my story and then the ways that you can support. You can either buy the book or buy several copies or hire me as a keynote speaker, hire me as a trainer. All of those funds are going into the book publishing. Right on, right on. Um, baby, did you, did you have any questions for the doctor? I do. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested as far as I know you're saying one of the big things that need to change, um, is leadership and the people involved, um, in these companies. And I'm, I'm curious what you think as far as, you know, the, the younger generations that are coming into the workforce, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting time with, you know, Twitter and social media and, you know, quote unquote, woke culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious where you think that's going, because I feel like we're seeing a lot of both extremes where we are seeing a lot of support for diversity and inclusion, but at the same time, we're also seeing the extreme on the other side. So I'm kind of curious where you potentially see that going in the future. So that's very interesting because the, the, what research has shown is that the baby boomer generation, in com if you have the baby boomers are leaving the workforce right now, right? But Gen right. X, we don't have enough Gen Xs to take over those leadership roles and those managerial roles because there are less population mm. of those people in the workforce. So now, mm -hmm. like, companies have to promote millennials and Gen Zs. So that just mm -hmm. for that generation, that, that what's happening in the generations in the workforce is going to force company to promote people that are younger into higher positions because you don't have the talent pool. If you look at the numbers of yeah. the people that are leaving and the people that are being promoted, the people that are entering, there is a huge gap in the amount of people that we have available that are from Gen X. And Gen Z has demonstrated that they do care a lot about uh, making a social impact and being uh, engaging in corporate responsibility. So I do think that that is going to change the way that we look at companies and the role that companies play mm. in society. And I think that's why we have seen company all of a sudden, like taking a stance on certain things because Gen Z is yeah. are demanding that and people are demanding that. And they're just saying, well, you have a huge, you have a huge power structure in this society. You have to do something about this. And I feel that, you know, now companies are taking on those roles. I don't know how good or bad it's going to be in the future, right? Because we're talking about, um, I mean, it's going to be good for society in the future that companies are involved. But like you said, when they're involved, they can be involved for the right reasons or for the wrong reasons. So Come before on, we right? used to have companies that companies used to be like, well, I don't want to talk about politics and I don't want to talk about, you know, religion and I don't want to do that. I just want to go and do my company. But now the times are changing and people are demanding mm -hmm. that from companies. And who knows what's going to happen? I, 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 I cannot wait to see what's going to happen 30 years from now. But I yeah. do know that people are realizing that this discrimination and exclusion of minorities cannot continue on. It's not sustainable. It's not fair. It's inhumane. And minorities are going to become the new majority because the demographics are mm -hmm. that Hispanics are growing in population. Um, 
in black students and in, in Hispanic students where like there are more people that look like me that are a minority in higher education than white students. So inevitably, like something needs to change, like either companies change and become more inclusive or the demographics is going to force them to go into that direction. But there is no coming back. Like, I think we started to change now, but it's going to eventually yeah. change. It has to change. Well, that's, I mean, and that's exactly what needs to change. Pardon my dog. Is okay. being, uh, <laughs> Kat, will you um, go? Would you, like, uh, is it yep. good? All right, never mind. <laughs> Okay, we're good. We're going to keep, you know what? We're going to keep this in the uh -huh. audio. All right, but um, before we get out of here, because I, I I know we both got to, we got to head out, but um, what would you say to yourself going back, you know, to you as during some of your worst times, what would you say to yourself knowing who you are now? What would you say to that person? I will say, one of the things I will say, is everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Very simple. And I will say this because when you're going through tough times, your brain will convince you that the world is falling apart. That there is no way out. That this is the, this is the last straw. What are you going to do from here? Who's going to respect you? What's going to happen? And, and one of the experiences that taught me that was before I came to the U.S., I, I was pregnant at 15. And it was very hard because, you know, being a teenager and pregnant, and then, you know, I eventually lost the, the baby and everything. But when that was happening, there was, I remember feeling like, oh, this is the end of my life. Like, this is that. Like, there is nothing that, like, I'm not going to be able to go to school. I'm not going to be able. And I, I can see that, how, that that can play in your head whenever you're going through tough times. But then I look at myself now and I'm like, since that happened, I came to the U.S. I have my bachelor's degree. I have two kids. I'm married. I'm a certified coach. I coach people from Facebook, Google, Warner Media. I get invited to go into different uh, companies in co different uh, cities. I just came from Mexico doing a speech. Let's go. I wouldn't think that that was possible for me at that moment at the time because your brain will tell you that the world is falling apart. And I, if you are going through tough times, I will tell you, you're going to go through it. Like it's something that in life, you just have to go through it. It's not something that yeah. punishes you and then it finishes you. You have to think of life as something that you're just walking through it. But it happened to me at my job was very bad, was very inhumane, was very sad. It really sh shook my confidence. It shook my identity as a person. It shook a lot of things in me, mm. but then I had to remind myself, I'm just going to go through it. 20 years from now, I'm going to look back and say, I knew it was going to be okay. So I think that's the message. It's going to be okay. That's the message, right? That's the message. And you, okay, you mentioned falling apart. So I got to ask you, last last thing. Why? You worked at McDonald's. <laughs> Why is the damn ice cream machine always falling apart? I need to know I don't it. Know. Dr. <laughs> I only know that I used to well, be you... in the drive-thru telling people that the ice cream machine is always broken. I, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I think there was an article that was published in the Harvard Business Review that talked about how bad so customer service is actually good for companies. They make money. I don't know how, but yeah. it's like retaining people. Like for some reason, people don't give up things that don't work for them. So they just keep calling and that makes yeah. them more money. There is an article over there. So you should look it up. It said how bad customer service creates revenue for company. So maybe oh my God. Wow. there is something okay. about an ice cream machine that maybe what's going on is people have the hope that one day it's going to be fixed. So they keep coming back and spending money. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. I had to ask. I had to ask. <laughs> so I, I, I appreciate you. I, I really appreciate you just taking your time out and stopping by. Uh, and uh, please, everyone that's listening, uh, make sure you check her out. Check, uh, uh, go to her website um, and her Instagram. You follow. Uh, uh, what's your Instagram again? Prof I'm sorry. Capellan, P R O F, like Professor Capellan, C A P E L L A N. Capellan or Capis Capellan, Capi Capellan, Capellan as well. Yeah. Okay. Because I was like, sorry, wait a minute. I've been assimilated. I, <laughs> <laughs> we don't need the code oh, switch on this no. show. Okay. 
So, but thank you so much, doctor, for your time. It really means the world to me and, and, and Kat. And so, um, I, we just wish the best of luck for you. And, and, uh, we know, we know, looking forward to seeing on you and your next Ted talk. Uh, hopefully, uh, maybe you and McDonald's can work something together and get these damn ice cream machines yes, fixed. McDonald's, if you're listening to me, <laughs> I'm going to be your next DNI person. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, cut her a check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another thing we didn't talk right, about, but that's in the next one. About money. Okay, you money. Get one. Yeah, when if it, you hey, care when, about it, pay. When the book drops. Yeah, and I'm glad I made it. <laughs> exactly. Glad you made it. Hey, I see she did the name yeah. of the thing. She did the name of the show, y'all. First doctor that we've had on, on and the I'm show. And I'm glad I made I it to it. this podcast. Yes. Thank you so much, so much. I'm going to take you out, and you, you have a great day.